Okay. So today we're excited to have Emily Reeder, a senior analytics manager at Capital One, give her excellent presentation on Python ergonomics, modern Python tools that feel like R. So without further ado, Emily, feel free to share your screen and start sharing your wisdom with all of us. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Really um, honored to be here today and exciting to be talking about um, Python ergonomics with you all. So let me um, share my screen and make sure everyone can see it. Um, let me know as everyone assuming things are good unless I hear otherwise, and we'll get going. So um, as Liz said today, I'm here to talk about Python ergonomics. And I could have also started this presentation by saying bonjour, but I would have had to stop there because that's pretty much all the French I know. And if you're anything like me, I think that's like often pretty reminiscent of my journey when trying to like switch between different coding languages. It can be really easy to like learn those first couple of catchphrases, whether that be saying hello and goodbye in a foreign language or uh, learning how to redo a fourth an if statement, variable assignment in Python. But after that easy surface level comparison, it gets a lot harder to get into like the real workflow and enjoy the like parts of the language that make us really hyper productive. Or as Hadley says, learn how to just type art. And I think that's really the challenge that can be really hard when it, like moving between R and Python is not like learning the basics of the syntax, but getting to the point where it really starts to feel good and feel natural. And code once again becomes a way that's expressive and really additive into how we're thinking about problems and lets us have a real conversation with our data and with the problem we're trying to solve instead of being this impediment and this roadblock and this thing we're trying to translate between. So as I've tried to move back and forth between R and Python, I think what I've come to realize is a lot of the more modern tools in the Python ecosystem are starting to have um, semantics or what I'll, I call ergonomics that start to feel a lot more like what I know I personally love about R. So what I want to do today is um, share kind of my personal opinions and want to be clear up front, this is like truly all just like one person's opinions on the topic. Obviously, a lot of great packages out there, a lot of great stack that you can use but kind of explore um, kind of a curated set of tools in three different parts. First, I think want to level set a little so you know where I'm coming from on what parts it is of our tools that to me feel so ergonomic and really excite me about um, kind of working in R and specifically the tidyverse. And I think that'll set up a good comparison for exploring specifically first and foremost for data wrangling, why I've really come to enjoy the Polar's package. And we'll kind of get into some of the deep weeds of how Polar's mirrors these ergonomics, not just by directly copying syntax of a different language, but really by embedding, in my opinion, some of the same core underlying language philosophy. And then finally, we'll take a step back from just that one package to look at the broader landscape of Python and how you can really create um, what, in my opinion, is a very like natural and ergonom ergonomic developer experience in Python. So let's start at the beginning. When I tried to think about how would I characterize the things that I particularly enjoy in R, I figured I couldn't do better than turning back to the Tidyverse creators themselves and thinking about um, kind of the ergonomic principles that they've embedded in the official Tidyverse design principles. And if you haven't seen um, their website, they have a great um, kind of resource listed out with really, really detailed documentation of how they think about um, many different aspects of package design and highly recommend looking this up. But I just pulled out three that I think most resonated with me for the purpose of package comparison. And those are being um, things that are composable, that allow us to really like, really give us those rich like sync verbs of a language and let us kind of like take Lego blocks or words or whatever analogy you want and build them back up into these complex customized expressions. Secondly, um, consistency, where what we learn about one function or package can be easily applied somewhere else. 
So we get a lot of these synergies and transferable knowledge that even if we're using a tool for the first time or reading code that someone else wrote, we can kind of figure out and intuit what it's supposed to do. And finally, being human-centered and designed to support the activities of data analysis, being kind of aware of the types of problems that we'll be kind of using that tool for, and um, as Hadley's also talked about, helping us fall into like the pits of success by working kind of doing what we'd expect. And I think that in my opinion, I think the tidyverse is super true to its word of meeting these objectives. And I'll just give like a little bit more concrete example of each of these. In terms of being composable, I think we've seen a lot of functions that are really good at uh, having very clear atomic tasks not kind of like mammoth functions that are doing tons of things, having tons of arguments, but each function has kind of a very clear purpose. And more importantly, for piecing them together, like with piping, we know that um, a lot of like dplyr, for example, takes a very strong data frame in, data frame out philosophy. And that's both makes things more composable, but of course it also makes things more consistent because we can better anticipate both what that function is going to return as well as what it's supposed to be input. And of course, consistency in the tidyverse, we know can take many different forms, both syntactically having everything in very readable snake case where most of the functions are verb names. We have everything generally being a functional paradigm. So we're not modifying underlying data objects when we pass them into a function, but instead that function is returning a new object with new values. So it's hard to um, accidentally modify data we don't need to. And um, we have similar workflows for similar results. And for that, I mean, um, an example that we'll come to later on in the presentation is there's a really nice synergy between how we do aggregation in the tidyverse and how we do window functions, where we're trying to achieve sort of similar things. So they have sort of similar structures. And then finally, with um, human centeredness, I think we often get like really comfortable the way that things can just kind of work. And we had a nice balance between things that are more declarative and things that are procedural, which means that we're not um, exactly telling R how it has to execute every single calculation as you would in a purely procedural language, but we're, we still have a good sense of how the underlying code will work, how the order of executions will operate. It's very transparent, which makes things, things easier to debug. And I know originally when I tried to move my workflow over to Pandas, I personally did not find all of these things to be true. And again, I, I'm not here to cast aspersions on Pandas today. Absolutely not my point. But um, I think as a different language built for different purposes, it prioritizes slightly different things. I found it like not always so composable. The data frames weren't always like kind of the primary object of manipulation. Not always so consistent um, that sometimes even the same core functions we use for filtering, for mutating, for creating new columns, for reshaping data, sometimes had like pretty different structures of arguments. For example, um, to filter rows in a pandas data frame, you can pass a, a query function, which takes kind of all those logical conditions in a single string. Whereas to do the equivalent of a mutating pandas, you're passing in more anonymous functions to um, kind of do these other data frame type manipulations. And finally, like for some of these reasons, again, to me personally, Pandas just felt a little bit less human-centered, which um, kind of required more me to like kind of break out of the mode of the problem I was trying to solve to confront things like, oh, what do I want to be my index column? And how do I think about that differently than a normal column? And am I trying to apply this operation to the rows or the columns? And I found so often I was just thinking more about these meta issues of like accounting about my data frame and pulling, it was pulling me personally away from the problem. And again, not here to cast aspersions on pandas. And I always want to call out no language is static either. Some of my used to be favorite examples of some things that I found strange in pandas have actually recently changed in some of the really recent um, versions 2.0 plus releases. But um, again, that like just kind of drawing some differences and some comparisons of why 
I kind of like personally steered a little bit away from what we may think of as being gold standard. And so backing into the broader ecosystem, I think I'm possibly not the only person that may have felt some of this way the very first time I started to learn Python and found that there's actually many different and interesting options for data wrangling in the Python space. Of course, we have Pandas, which is in fact, I mean, Python goat of data wrangling, without a doubt. But um, started to become aware of some other interesting options out there, including um, pullers and events. And each have very different pros and cons. Um, pullers is a kind of emerging like language that is backend driven in Rust. So it's super fast. I found it to be super well documented. And in my opinion, has the most similar ergonomics to R, which we'll be deep diving on that in a minute. So you can be the judge. You can tell me if you agree. I will um, be arguing my case for that today. Of course, there is like kind of some learning curve because any language is different. And while there's growing adoption, it does have um, kind of obviously less legacy code than pandas. And I think that's an important aspect to always think not only which piece of syntax do you like the best, but where's kind of the overall broader Python community at? Because as we know from R, part of what makes R great is not just the languages and the packages themselves, but the community that surrounds it with the bastion of Stack Overflow questions and answers and learning resources. And while those are definitely emerging in pullers, you still won't find the same body as Canvas. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I just want to briefly call out, um, there's this project called Ibis, which is very interesting, very powerful. It's all actually built by Wes McKinney, who first created Pandas, and who has now moved over um, to Posit Connect himself to work on some of these interoperable um, projects full time. And this is in some ways more like a DB choir and that like it adds a meta language at the top level that can translate into many, many different backends. So it can run against databases, it can run against data frames, et cetera. And it does have an API that is probably even more similar to dplyr than um, is folders. But I personally at this point have shied away from it because I think it has more of those problems being a little lower adoption, a little earlier stage, but just want to kind of highlight that, um, again, this is a kind of fast moving ecosystem. And I think different kind of use cases for what you're doing with Python, obviously different options may be the best which sort of ties me into like also what to prioritize when you're thinking about moving between new languages and selecting new packages. And I sort of going back to this analogy of learning a new foreign language, I sort of think of it as a different, as kind of a binary choice of, are you looking to actually move and settle into Python as a permanent resident of the Python community? Or are you just looking to be that tourist where occasionally you have to get something done in Python but you really want to retreat to R. I think if you're really looking to become a full-fledged um, kind of Python programmer, it's really important to press simultaneously balance finding the ergonomics that most help you transfer your existing skills, recreate that flow state we talked about, but also still have enough prevalence in the Python community that you can find answers to questions, that other people will be excited about the projects you're building and can collaborate with, and help you make get the shortest learning curve from zero to 100. But if you are just that tourist that maybe you have some colleagues that work in Python, you have to like dip in and dip out, you may want to actually prioritize these things that are closer syntax copies that kind of get you to zero to one faster, even if they might take you a little longer to get from zero to 100. And kind of like where I personally landed is if you're looking to really move into Python, get Python citizenship, um, you may want to start with polars and eventually probably play with some pandas. Um, but if you're looking to be that tourist, you can actually get a really, really long way with some of the great direct ports like Ibis and Ceva. So again, a lot of different options depending on what you're going for. But for the rest of this presentation, I wanna really focus on this first category and talk a little bit more about what does it mean to move into Python with a tool like um, polars and how do it recreate some of those ergonomics we talked about before that I find really powerful. 
So to make the case about wide folders, we're first going to start with a silly, silly data set, just three columns, A, B, and C, where B and C are both just simple indicator columns, and A is a string. And I went back and forth in my mind when I was starting this presentation, whether or not I wanted to use just a silly trivial data set like this, or whether I wanted to like go back to one of our mainstay examples, like bringing in the iris data set or the penguins data set. And the reason I chose to use like this trivially simple data set for this example is I realized that's very much kind of how I knew languages and how I kind of recommend when you're playing with new packages and tools. I think one of the highest leverage things you can like learn how to do is just mock up a just silly simple data set to just test out new functions before you're trying them out on real data to just help you make sure you like totally understand what's happening kind of like unit testing in real time. So we'll use this, um, again, make friends with a silly data set for the purposes of examples today. So what makes polars um, kind of similar to R? Why do I say that it has similar economics? We can think about that in multiple different ways. There's kind of the like basic superficial level of similarity, and there's the deeper philosophical similarity. And both are important for different reasons. So at this basic superficial surface level, um, pan, the polars, of course, has all the same core functionality as a deep fire, and in most cases has very similar syntax for accomplishing that basic functionality. So we can see for the kind of like same just main class of go-to verbs in deep fire, select, filter, mutate, group by, summarize, Polars has almost one for one analogies to all of these, uh, with the exception of slight differences in naming for both um, the mutate and summarize, instead maps to with columns and ag. And I think this is more mirroring the syntax that's very popular in um, PySpark, which in some ways is kind of a um, another nice benefit of using polars is um, if you ever need to like work on really massive data sets and switch to something like PySpark. Uh, the syntax there is also very similar, so it's kind of a nice little bridge language. Um, additionally, you know, for the same multi-table functions, um, unioning and joining, we have all the same functionality, very similar APIs, right down to the fact that in both Dplyr and Polars, um, for joining, that's where we start to get in a little bit into the human centeredness that both of them know the kind of problems that data analysts typically face while joining data. So they have the same sort of optional arguments for doing things like validating if you thought your join was one to one or one to many, double checking that in the join function itself. And um, with these functions, you can actually put them together in very, very similar ways with that sense of um, composability. Of course, I think many of us that use the tidyverse really like um, the piping operators that were first originated in the tidyverse itself, and since have migrated their way up into base R, where instead of writing very, very nested functions, we can write them in the order of operations that they're actually executed. And similarly in polars, we can do, and really all of Python, when you have methods, you can do the same thing with something called um, method chaining, where you basically just have a dot, between each um, function and you're calling your methods in order instead of having um, types. And um, the only kind of key difference is in Python, if we need many, many arguments, in R we can just with pipe, kind of take new lines whenever we want. Um, in Python, you just need to kind of like wrap that entire expression, tip to tail in parentheses. But curiously, the one difference in how uh, Python and Polars in particular and R think about this issue of composability is Polars actually takes this idea and curiously enough goes one step further than in dplyr. In dplyr, I notice people often train data frame level functions, but tend to like nest and go back to more the more traditional syntax for column level functions. So for example, it's more common to within a um, mutate statement, have kind of the more condensed version of kind of modifying a variable and assigning it back to a column versus this really stretched out version shown on line five. Either would work, 
but um, I think five, what do you say on five, tends to be a little verbose. I don't feel like you see that all that much in practice. But um, in polars, because of the kind of like compactness of method chaining and um, the consistency of their stack, you can actually carry on the same kind of composable, um, literate, right in the same order you operate it function or like concept within each column assignment itself, which I think makes code all the more literate. And so just kind of to like wrap up these superficial surface level comparisons, this just kind of shows a little bit of this like basic polars code in action, taking that silly simple data set we started out with, adding some new columns with with columns, which again is like our mutate, selecting out some of those columns. You can see that while the fire uses kind of the raw uncoded column names, um, polars kind of does something similar in making you not continue to reference your data frame, but it wraps those variable names in the um, column identifier. Um, same filtering, group by, aggregation. Likely, if you've ever written dplyr code, you can probably read this, anticipate what the output would be, even if you've never read that. But again, that's just all on these the level of silly, superficial, surface-level comparisons. The thing that gets me more excited about working in polars is actually the ways that I, the kind of smaller advanced features that I think show the um, kind of really deeper um, philosophical similarities to dplyr. So I'll start out with just a few examples of these. I know I mean these to be comprehensive. I don't pretend these are the most important features of the language, but I just showed these as illustrations of the fact some of these things exist to me, get me excited of this is a language I can feel with, I can shape with, I can build with, I can think with. Um, and starting out with horizontal functions. Um, in dplyr, I think a uh, relatively recent innovation was introducing the rowwise operator, which helps you kind of specify if you're applying an aggregate function down a column or across a row, which is um, one that really hits home for me because I remember in my first year at my first job, literally missing like three trains at the end of a workday because I couldn't figure out what was wrong with my code. And it was because I didn't understand the difference between max and pmax. So dplyr is now solved for that problem and will help people not miss the last express train. And um, very similarly in polars, uh, again, like slightly different, you could argue kind of like maybe more Pythonic approach to handling the issue but they also want to achieve that same kind of clarity in what direction you're aggregating across, not by, um, you know, in pandas, you're often have to specify an access you're operating on and remember is access one or zero or two, the one that will get me a row or a column. Instead, pan polars introduce these nice helper functions with um, kind of taking the max or the sum or a number of different aggregates and specifying writing the method name as a separate method that it's horizontal versus vertical. Um, and then similarly, a second kind of like class functions that Polaris has enabled that I find incredibly powerful is the idea of column selectors. Recent uh, releases of dplyr have made it increasingly easy to grab out variables to operate on in many different ways, such as by name, such as if they start with, end with, contain some common prefix, if they match your right X, or if they're of a certain type, or if they're even a, can, one of many of the specified list of variables. And um, I think this is something that I know I found incredibly powerful in my wrangling work, in my cleaning work, in many different workflows, and was really gratified to find that this is um, equally easy to do in polars. Um, again, this simple example just shows if we want to take the mean of a bunch of indicator variables to calculate a lot of proportions. There's a really literate and concise way to express that um, in polars that feels very much like the dplyr version, which I think really shows both kind of the polars, again, both consistency and composability with this like ability to express these complex ideas in this really concise way. And I think also really gets back to that like human aspect of the code of like anticipating a little the types of problems we want to solve. 
And you can build this up in this feature up into more comprehensive workflows. So for example, not taking just the mean of a bunch of indicator variables, but then but kind of then having them called indicator variables when they're not no longer indicator variables, but then um, kind of continuing to chain on methods like adding different prefixes, suffixes, or aliases. So now instead of the previous example where we modified those columns, we now have um, our original columns, but our new columns with the new calculations named more appropriately for what they are. And um, I'll get off column name selectors in a minute. This is fairly a uh, concept I'm a little too excited about, um, but just as one last example, I found this really um, powerful workflow even for things like data cleaning. If we have messy data like um, spring, strings with a bunch of white space or dates formatted not in asset format, uh, which is curiously enough, both um, examples of things I was battling against last Saturday um, can kind of like can kind of express the kind of cleaning operations we want to do in a really concise way. So for all um, columns that end with date, cast them to date format. For all columns that are strings that don't end in phrase date, um, you know, strip out that white space. And then the final example I want to hit on of kind of this like deeper kind of like both syntactic and philosophical similarities between dplyr and pullers is in window. Um, window functions, just if you haven't encountered that name before, are essentially when you're trying to compute an aggregate over your data set by group, but you don't want to like crunch up the data set into fewer rows. You want that um, kind of every row in your existing data frame to include that kind of group level value. So for example, if I have a data set with a bunch of um, customers and all of their purchase histories, you might want to find the maximum amount that customers ever spent in a transaction, but have that reflected in every single row of their purchase history. And in Dplyr, I've often thought it has a really nice parallel in um, kind of the philosophical way you express this. Because you want to take an aggregate expression, we use group by, just like we would in a group by summarize. But because we want to preserve that same granularity of the data in the same number of rows, we say group by mutate. And again, even if you've never written this code before, it just kind of clicks and it just kind of makes sense why it works that way as opposed to either SQL or Pandas, where again, not to pick on any language, but those off, those kind of the workflows and the way you express a window function feels very different than how you express an aggregate function, which has just always been a little curious. And then similarly in Fuller's, I found kind of their approach, again, while it's not the same syntax as dplyr, and it's definitely more Pythonic, it's kind of like true to its roots, I think it's equally expressive because once again, we're using this with columns function, which really says like, hey, I wanna like return a consistent output that has the same number of rows as what you gave me originally, but then we're still able to apply the same aggregate functions in the same way we would um, in dplyr. So again, just really concise, but really expressive language. And uh, the final comparison I'll make, although I will dwell on it, is list columns. I think these are a less commonly used feature in dplyr generally, but if you do work a lot, for example, moving data in and out of JSON formats or other like more unstructured, more nested data, um, dplyr has made that very easy by um, a lot letting people use kind of like list columns, letting people use nested data frames. And that's something else I've really enjoyed that it has relatively similar workflows for accomplishing some of those tasks. So that completes just kind of my um, random sample smattering of some of the ways I find folders to be kind of powerful, exciting, and just somehow just philosophically similar to the expressiveness of the types. And hopefully I've convinced you that um, there may be something there and that may be something worth checking out. But um, kind of last note to argue against myself and to give you kind of fair perspective, um, no abstraction is perfect. And also want to um, 
say that unfortunately, I think one of the biggest pitfalls and frustrations in DeepFire is curiously enough because it uses similar abstractions, something you may actually also run into in polars. Um, I think one of the hardest parts of designing any data wrangling language is figuring out kind of how you want to identify the column names. Um, in R, you know, we don't have, in DeepFire, we don't have to kind of code our column names. We just type them out as draw variables, which can be great, super concise, super readable a lot of times, but it's like caused a lot of iterations over time with um, kind of Rlang and different um, workflows that the Shine First teams had to invent for doing things like dynamically referencing column names, dynamically renaming column names. Polars, as I mentioned before, instead chooses to represent column names as strings. That has some benefits, but some costs. Um, and the easiest way, in my opinion, to break Polars code and mess up Polars code is to not realize when you're, or to not, to think you're actually trying to create a string, but when you're actually referencing a column name. So you can see in this top example, uh, you might naively like try to make a new variable Z that has value A. Uh, Polars will not interpret that as value A. It will interpret that as take the values from my column A, um, which can kind of introduce some um, kind of risk of error, some kind of tricky situations to debug. And how you solve for that is you wrap actual um, literal strings in the pl.lib function. So again, I think ironically, having some of the same kind of benefits as Dplyr, also some of the same uh, nuances, which perhaps just suggests that um, yet another way that naming things continues to be the hardest part of any language. But then backing up a step beyond polars, I'll just briefly mention a couple of other packages for a core data analysis and Python toolkit that I think can be useful. Um, Obviously, DataViz, I think, can be another challenging thing when you're moving between um, R and Python. Even, I think, the most stalwart Python fan can never uh, reject the fact that ggplot2 is amazing and very, very hard to um, counter. In the Python world, matplotlib is, of course, the most popular, most widely known um, foundational package for data visualization but it can be incredibly procedural. And again, not too out of that flow state because you do end up like getting a lot more into um, a very just like specific, like draw a line here, draw a line here, draw a line for this group, draw a line for that group um, type of interaction with your code because it doesn't really lean on any sort of underlying um, grammar of graphics like ggplot2. At the complete other end of the spectrum, we have plot nine, which is a truly amazing work of art as a ggplot2 port. Um, you can take a lot of your existing ggplot knowledge and make very nice graphs in kind of very short amounts of time. However, um, sort of similar to what I said about Ibis or Ciuba, um, this may have kind of like slightly lower adoption within the kind of like Python native community. And because of that, um, if you kind of hit that brick wall working with plot nine, it can be hard to get through. And sometimes when the abstraction and the one-to-one -one mapping with ggplot breaks, it's harder to intuit or reason your way through. You kind of just have to um, know or look up kind of the workaround to um, get back into how um, plot nine will interpret things because it's operating at this like little bit higher level of abstraction. Now in the middle of the one that I'm most excited about here is a project called Seaborn. Seaborn is um, really uh, also very popular, built on top of matplotlib, which has actual plot nine is as well. But um, recently introduced an uh, alternative interface for writing plots that was largely inspired um, by ggplot. So again, we'll see a lot of the same differences that we see moving from dplyr to polars, and that we're using method chaining versus pipes or plus signs but um, has, I think, like the, the potential to really become a nice mix of being easily interoperable with matplotlib, something that also has a lot of adoption in the Python world, but can allow us to really continue to think about expressing our plots in the grammar of graphics way that we all know and love. 
Um, so that's a project I'm following really closely, trying to use a lot. Um, however, the object interface is still experimental, so some things are still subject to change. And then the final piece, I think of a strong kind of data analysis toolkit in terms of curating packages is how to make a pretty data table in Python. Curiously, in terms of pure Python packages, there are relatively few gold standards. And I think that is um, largely attributable just to the fact that Python notoriously being called the second best language to do everything has people coming you know, from many, many different use cases and backgrounds that don't really focus on that data analysis and communication piece. So, plot, so tables seem to be a curiously slightly underinvested in area. But a project that for that reason that I'm particularly excited about is um, the posit team under Ocione has um, decided to port and make a mirror to the uh, GT package that is now really popular in R for having a grammar of tables and is mirroring that almost one-to-one -one for Python. So again, I think that is a still a relatively early stage project, but is really kind of like unlocking really next level capabilities. And of course, in a way that is super transferable between R and Python, since in that one case even has the same developer. And then the final piece that I'll call out when just thinking about picking actual packages and tools in Python is don't forget about the base language. I think in R sometimes we think about, about um, almost to an unfortunate extent, getting more in these like tribal warring factions of like the tidyverse crowd, the data table crowd, the base R crowd that um, sometimes almost create superficial distinctions. But um, I think it's really an, an interesting feature of Python that the base language in Python seems to be evolving a little bit um, more fluidly than kind of R's base language that's more super stable and a lot of the developments in the package space. Um, so always kind of good to like be sure you understand all of the latest and greatest and changing features in the Python based language themselves. Just as one example, uh, one that I highlighted here is the really um, amazing and rich kind of like language for string inter interpolation, which is very much like R's package. So if you want to essentially um, interpolate and concatenate variables in your data and in your computations with kind of strings to make them more human readable, um, very rich language for doing that, that all exists like in the base package itself. Um, you can see here just three examples of that string interpolation um, where we can do kind of higher level functions like uh, rounding and other types of formatting all in a very expressive way. So that's just some of my kind of like thoughts of like kind of top packages that I tend to gravitate towards that have really helped me like think in and embrace Python. But of course, beyond different languages or libraries, I think we all know that a developer experience is a lot more than just a few packages. Obviously, I think we've been very lucky in kind of your world to have a great IDE in our studio to have a lot of really surrounding um, great developer tools to help us along in our journey. And it's like, I think to really get comfortable in working with a new language, there's a lot more than just a couple of packages that we need to reconstruct. And I know some kind of problems people often face when switching between languages is even installing Python. Installing R, you kind of know you just go to the R website, click mirror, click download, good to go. Um, Python, even there, you face kind of a plethora of different options. And um, then for picking an IDE, again, there are just many, many competing choices. Um, our studio, of course, you can run Python in, but um, you also hear about Spider, JetBrains, Yes Code, so many different options. And um, there's just, I think, like a lot of different kind of choices at every single step of the way. So what I've listed out here and what I've explained more in a surrounding blog post is some personal favorites kind of across the spectrum of how to like migrate to Python for the whole game. For setting up and installing Python, I've come to really like PyM or the um, duplicate PyM1 uh, 
tool for those storefront windows, which um, has made it really easy to maintain multiple versions of Python on your computer at once, which again is really important for the reasons I mentioned that Python's base language tends to evolve more quickly. So often you may need different uh, versions of Python for different projects you're running. And this does a really nice job helping you switch between different versions of Python, have transparency into what's installed on your machine, making sure your environment variables are up to date and pointing to the right one. So much so that it seems to have inspired a related um, our project called Rig, which um, is also really interesting and something I've started kind of exploring myself. And um, kind of secondly, for um, kind of finding a optimal IDE, I think probably many of you have noticed if you've started to use Porto, um, even our posit itself has um, started to make itself very interoperable with VS Code. And I think that's been a um, kind of great advancement and a great language for, um, or a great IDE for working in Python. And there you'll find many of the same features that I think we love about your Studio IDE, a variable book explorer, easy access to a terminal, your file explorer, your kind of interactive REPL, and kind of scripts all in one place. Um, makes nice IDE for version control with Git. But I think most exciting are similar to our studio um, add-ons. Uh, VS Code has an incredibly rich set of um, extensions, which means that many packages um, or projects like Porto have really great um, fit for purpose extensions to the IDE, which again are super human centered, super aware of the views you'll want, the things you might wanna do, for example, at Porto previewing your final document that can make it um, just a really good partner for your work. Now, we already talked about a lot of kind of my recommendations and what I've tended to like in terms of that core analysis stack, so I won't repeat that. Um, and then on the developer experience side, did just want to highlight a couple more. Another nuance you'll find in Python is similar to how that base language is evolving very quickly. Um, in Python, it also becomes even more important than in R to um, kind of maintain your the conversions of each individual package. For um, all of the kind of uh, attention CRAN can draw at times, uh, both good and bad, for the um, kind of very, very proactive vetting process projects have to, packages have to go through in R to get those updates. That tends to um, make R a little bit more backwards compatible, whereas in Python, um, different versions can off, like I think more frequently cause breaking changes between. So environment management is really important and there are truly a unbelievable number of tools to attempt to solve that problem. You may hear about PIP, PIPM, PIP tools, and so very many. Um, one that I recommend, especially if you like RM now, is called PDM. A few reasons that I really like that is that it does a really good job separating out uh, automating the tracking of your primary dependencies and separating that out from the dependencies of your dependencies and the implications of that being if you install a package and then decide later you don't need it, it's really easy and transparent to clean that right out of your project with a single command and remove all traces. And it's also kind of reasonably fast, well-maintained, um, and actively growing. However, again, just to illustrate how fast the language is changing, literally just last week, um, a brand new environment manager just dropped that is getting a lot of hype online. So everything's subject to change. This is a very dangerous type of talk to give and will no doubt become dated very quickly. The very last plug I wanna make for developer experience as we wind down today is about um, kind of how to get help. I think when you're learning a new language, it can be easy to kind of assume a lot of tools um, aren't meant for you yet. You know, I mean, you'll hear about things like linting, styling, other types of like add-ons. It's like, ooh, I feel like only the more serious developers need those. But I actually think some of those can be some of the most helpful resources for beginners um, because it's kind of like getting an automatic coach and a peer review in the room with you as you're coding. 
So a few that I mentioned I uh, recommend on that is using rough for linting and styling. Again, this has a great VS Code add-on and um, kind of is great because it helps you like automatically get some tips and tricks of how to be a little bit more Pythonic because um, you know it'll automatically pop up a message for you in the console or when you run the rough command of like, hey, you know, like Python people tend to like prefer shorter lines of code and this line here is kind of long. So maybe you should make it a little bit shorter. And similarly with um, error lens, I found this to be a really great add-on that um, kind of line by line will immediately pop up almost quite honestly a little bit too proactively, but um, when you're typing code to let you know of any um, potential bugs such as um, a packages, package you imported and didn't use, a um, variable that's being referenced but was never assigned. Um, and you can just, again, like, Kind of act like that, go through that peer review from that Python perspective for free. So I always encourage people to not, um, don't assume developer tools are only for the most advanced developers. I think they can actually be um, kind of a great helper as you're starting out. Now, next to last slide here, we've almost made it through, but I think um, kind of the last thing that I really wanted to hit on is um, the aspect of community. I think the obviously like we're here at our ladies today and part of the real value of um or the beauty and comfort we find in working in R is of course the rich community that surrounds it. It both makes it fun and exciting and like any good community gives us a sense of the safety net of like we know that, that there are people we can ask and get help from if we get stuck. Um, and so just to give some other ideas of if you're really looking to move into this Python world, how to get embedded in the culture, I think some kind of forums I found that I found particularly useful is discovering actually um, Python Reddit seems to be very active. That's never somewhere I've really turned to for um, the R world, but I've definitely learned a lot by kind of lurking on and just kind of imbibing through that channel um, for in terms of like Python reading and books. Um, many Python projects tend to get structured like Python packages, which is not a bad kind of way to like just learn to write and manage Python projects. And two really great books there. First is by a fellow R lady, Tiffany Timbers, and a co-author um, about kind of how to write Python packages. Also does a great job walking you through a different developer experience. She really likes poetry as kind of the overall structure. Or there's a Pi OpenSci organization for um, scientific computing that um, just released a really great guide on package development there. So definitely recommend checking both of those out. And um, finally, I've just listed a couple of um, Python podcasts that I've gotten a lot out of, again, just being being able to learn how to be that fly on a wall, hear about interesting developments, interesting releases, how different Python developers have thought about building and sharing their projects. I know I've found super valuable. So um, thank you very much all for your time today. I think this is an issue that I continue to have the goal of kind of exploring more and in more detail throughout the year. I think this today, I just wanted to give kind of the bird's eye view but um, I've written a few blogs on some of these topics in more detail and hope to continue to flesh those out. And if you have kind of similar thoughts and experiences or selfishly for me, even better if you have very divergent thoughts and experiences, would absolutely love to hear from you all um, as you kind of explore the same. So um, thank you very much. And I will turn it over if anyone has questions, comments. Thank you so much, Emily. Excellent presentation. Um, now, Somia will moderate the Q&A. If you have any questions, please use the raise your hand feature or type your question into the chat and Somia will go in order of first to last questions. Thanks, Alyssa. And thank you, Emily, for your wonderful talk. Just waiting for people to drop their questions in the chat or raise their hands. And other thing, like besides questions, I'll just throw out there. If like I personally would love nothing more 
that if anyone wanted to like chime in and be like, well, actually, I found this Python package and I actually think it's a lot better. Like, please, if you have other like, like very, very open to comments more than like questions, like with, that would make my day. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, I can go actually. I, I I just have a question, not not an interesting comment though. <laughs> um, it was from one of your uh, oh uh, excuse me, I think John. John Michelle shared a, a let to say thanks for the column names as contracts post. Uh, John, could you explain more what that is? Oh. Oh, sorry. This is this is a tan tangent a little bit, but I I wanted to thank you for the uh the post of column names as contracts. So for those who haven't read this, I think it's it's really great. It's about uh well naming conventions and and consistency. Oh, well, thank you, John. And regrettably, I think everyone here probably, even if you haven't read it, you probably like I've already like you probably noticed I ended up kind of like converging back into that when like this talk very almost became just like me talking about like, I used to do column names as contracts and folders. And then I was like, okay, got to cut out some of these like column selector slides. So, um, but yeah, definitely um, one aspect of the ergonomics of R that I know I've really loved and is definitely something that I look for when moving to any other language. So. Well, the reason I brought that up. Words. The reason I brought it up, it was really interesting, kind of the interplay with the things you're you're doing, especially with any of the the functions. Like, how much gain do you see from that? Because I think it's un it's not always clear to people that like starts with ID, you know, you know, starts with N underscore or something like that. How these can be combined with the ergonomics you're talking about, and how those two together, the power really kind of compounds. Yeah, no, for sure, it's like column names are like the part of a language it like it's almost like you have the power within you to expand like a language is ergonomics in a way so um yeah no thank you for bringing that up Um, oh, there's another question from John. How do you not, um, how do you not start doing, uh, the pipe operator in Python? That, that is a tricky one. And I'll tell you, even in R, I had a, I have mostly still failed to break the habit of doing that instead of the new, um, base R pipe operator. So, um. Definitely a hard switch to make, but I think I have come to like, I can never say I favor the version of Python, but I think I have come to like really appreciate its conciseness. Oh, thank you, John. That is a good tip. I think our studio has base operators and option and preferences. I'll have to look into that. Um, any other questions or comments from people? Um, I had a question about packages, um, like the comparison of importing packages through tidyverse in R versus um, the the syntax you used to import Polar and like other functions. I saw that there was one package that was imported as Polar SPL, and then there was a CS. Could you explain more as to what's going on there? 
Yeah, definitely. It's that's a like really interesting fundamental difference between R and um, Python at the packaging level. You know, R fun. If you've ever written an R package, you just kind of like dump all the code in a uh, folder called R. Um, Python is like very modular, and I don't mean that in the sense of just like compartmentalized. Like literally has like kind of things called modules. And if you look at the source code for a Python package, you'll see they're actually code is like organized into a lot of different files and a lot of different folders, which unlike R actually do have implications for how you import that thing. So, um, you know, to kind of help organize code, there are, you know, like some polars functions that are available at the polars like level of the hierarchy you can mm -hmm. think of it as for like columns vectors that almost exists in what you can think of as like a subdirectory of the polars project and um there are multiple ways then that you can import if you've just imported polars you can kind of get to that thing by typing you know like pl dot columns vectors dot starts with but that gets really verbose so the same way that when we import folders, we can say import folders as PL and create that alias that makes it easier to reference. You can kind of import a submodule and give it a separate alias just to like make it more concise. That makes sense. Thanks. And the other thing that I found kind of cool about that from a um, coding or from a readability perspective is then it helps me kind of like tell immediately by just by looking at my imports what functionality from that package I actually am going to be using in the script. You know, it's kind of like a nice little preview. Whereas like if you see somebody's done like library tidyverse at the top of the script, it's like, well, this could be like literally anything. All right. Um. Lily dropped something in the chat. Lily, do you want to explain that, uh, or just explain in the chat? Either, either works. Um. Yeah. Sorry. It's just uh where you can change the the pipe thing and the preferences. It's like the third thing down in that screenshot, or like, yeah. Is that chat just with? You somehow mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it. John's the last guy I see in the uh, overall chat. That's weird. Um, might be like some security thing, but if you just go to, I can just type the um process. I can also DM it to you, Emily. Oh yeah, thank you. That'd be great. It is past time I make the switch. Are you able to see it now? I not. Hmm. Yeah, it's so odd. The last thing I see in the chat is from John still. Okay. I think um, it has to do with our security preferences. Interesting. Let's see, I just downloaded it and I'll share my screen. Oh, I see it from Lily now. That's weird, very delayed, but i um, got it this time. Oh, awesome. It's good to know. Thank you, Lily. Oh, John, that's a good question. What is hard in both? It still seems like it should be. I really like that question. Probably at their highest level, like I think one off the top of my head, one similar pitfall that's like being solved for by other things. But I think, you know, both um, 
both R and polars are still, or like I should say like pure vanilla deep fire and polars are still largely using that kind of like in memory paradigm. So I think, you know, can always be hard if we're like trying to work with super huge data locally on our laptop. Of course, I think deep fires really tried to solve for that through the DB fire package, which can translate our code and ship it to a different database. Um, Polars, I don't believe has an interface for that in the same way. Whereas, um, like I mentioned, the Ibis project, I think is also trying to work on that exporting compute elsewhere. But I think if you're using pure deep fire or pure polars, that's probably one similar challenge is the like working in memory. All righty. If no one else has any um, additional questions for Emily, we're going. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and um, wrap up the meeting. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate you being here to learn and collaborate with one another. Um, yeah, we hope to see you at um, upcoming Our Ladies Baltimore meetings as well. And this recording will be posted on YouTube soon. So bye, everyone. Thank you again for your time. And we hope you learned a lot from Emily's talk. And, and thank you again, Emily, for taking the time to speak with all of us. Really, really appreciate it.